So this evening we're on to our next minor prophet, uh, which is Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk really, probably best summed up in terms of an introduction, is the word probably. Uh, because we don't know much about Habakkuk. Uh, best guess is that he was a prophet by profession, rather than someone like Amos, uh, who we saw last time was a shepherd by trade. He probably lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. There's no mention made here of the northern kingdom. He probably lived in the run up to the exile into Babylon and probably under the time of a not so good king, maybe Jehoiachin. What is clear though, and is not a probably, is that he looks at his nation and he isn't happy. He looks around and he doesn't like what he sees. And he wants to know why God isn't doing anything. He wants to know why God isn't stepping in like he did in the olden days and stopping the mess that he's seeing all around him. And the book really is Habakkuk crying out uh, to God for answers. And amazingly, in the book of Habakkuk, God answers his questions. So the book sort of functions like a Q&A in that way. Question, answer, question, answer, and then sort of closing in prayer. That's really the, the way that the book goes. And that's the structure that we're going to follow this evening. So we're going to go through the message uh, as we go through. So Q&A part one. Why don't you act? Uh, I'll just read to you the first four verses uh, of the book. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralysed. And justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk looks at the world around him, looks at the nation around him, and he sees violence. Violence comes up six times in the opening two chapters. He lives in a world where destruction and violence have become the norm. The courts at the city gate, they don't seem to do anything about it. The land is sinking into a violent pit where mob rule is the only rule that counts. And the prophet is crying out to God, asking why? How could you let this happen? And we can associate with those feelings, can't we? We are blessed in our country by wonderful things like police officers and laws that at least in theory seem to deal with these sorts of things. But we know the realities of this. I looked at some statistics this week just to get an idea that, for example, maybe one in ten women over the age of 16 was subject to some form of domestic abuse last year. There were nearly one million violent crime incidents reported last year in the UK. One million. There's only 70 million people in the country. And I mean, just look at the news globally. Look at what's happening in the Middle East. Look what's happening in Ukraine. In all these war-torn lands, as Rose mentioned this morning, we don't even get places like Niger mentioned uh, so much on the news. What about the unborn? 200,000 babies were aborted in the UK last year, and 73 million worldwide. That's more than the population of the UK every year, and they're disproportionately baby girls. And when we look at a situation like that, when we think about it, I mean, often we try not to think about it, don't we? But we're left with the same questions that Habakkuk is asking. Why? Why, Lord? How long until you act? How can you just sit idly by and watch this happen? What is going on? When are you going to hear our pleas for justice? When are you going to step in and save? And I'm sure most of us have had those thoughts, those sorts of prayers in our lives. It might not just be national and global things, it might be more personal injustice. With stats like the ones that I've just read, there'll be people in this room that have been affected by those things. Habakkuk, though, is in a very privileged position, in that he gets a direct answer from God. We don't all get that, do we? We don't get God telling us exactly why things are happening. But here, he speaks to Habakkuk, and it does give us some insight into our own situation in the world. And God's answer to Habakkuk is that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. We see that in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. 
Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am going to do a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. God is sending the Chaldeans or Chaldeans or Babylonians, whatever you want to call them, and he's going to use them to bring judgment on this violent people. They themselves are strong and mighty and ruthless, dreaded and fearsome. We're told in this chapter that their horsemen are swift like eagles, that their horses are fiercer than wolves. In other words, when God brings judgment, they don't stand a chance. It's likely by the time that Habakkuk is writing, this group have already started their campaigns across the Middle East. News would have reached them of this seemingly invincible enemy. An enemy that laughs at kings and fortresses, who revel in their own strength as though their strength is their God. They worship their own sheer might to go around and defeat nations. That's the answer that Habakkuk got. I wonder if that was the answer that Habakkuk was expecting or hoping for. I think he wanted swift judgment on some people, but it seems from what he says afterwards, he thinks that this everybody being judged here seems a bit harsh. And really, the Chaldeans? They're an interesting choice of instrument of righteousness from God. They're not an ancient enemy of Israel. On the world scene, they're the new kids on the block. And in terms of righteousness, well, they're about as wicked as they come. So it prompts Habakkuk to ask a second question. Why use the wicked to judge the more righteous? Let me just read to you verses 12 uh, to 15 as he asks the question. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you uh, idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked uh, swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them, out of, uh, brings them all out with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. It's as though Habakkuk saying, them, Lord? Really? The traitors? The wicked? Are you going to use them? Seriously, they're like fishermen, but they catch men. And not in good ways, like the disciples in the New Testament. How can you use them to judge people more righteous than they are? We won't die, will we? You're from everlasting, and we're your people. These guys, they're newbies, nasty ones. They're not a bit like you. Will you really use them? Then in the rest of chapter 2, uh, beginning of chapter 2, uh, he waits for his answer. He stands at the watchtower watching and waiting for God's response. And then in 2 verse 2, God answers. And really his answer is this. Firstly, righteousness is not what you think it is. But God will judge unrighteousness wherever he finds it, whatever form he finds it in. He starts off by telling Habakkuk to write down this vision. This is one to pass on to others. This that he's going to tell him hasn't happened yet, but it will. All they need to do is wait for it with the opposite attitude to the Babylonians. The Babylonians are puffed up, but righteousness, uprightness, as we've been hearing in Galatians, is about living by faith. That's where uh, Paul gets his quote from, from Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. And that's important thinking about Habakkuk's question. A person who's really righteous lives by faith. So it's not about who has the better or more wicked works. What God is looking for is humble faith in him. Humble faith here because it's portrayed as the opposite of being puffed up. Having confidence in yourself. Well, this is having confidence in God, not in your own might. The righteous live by faith, trusting in him to act, waiting on God to do what he will do. The Babylonians, on the other hand, were told they jump right in. 
Betrayed by their Dutch courage, they don't wait for God, but in their pride they line their pockets. They do it on the back of nations they invade, as though they're sort of collecting trophies in a cabinet. But God will bring judgment on them too. He pronounces five woes in this chapter that will happen to the Babylonians after they've uh, finished meeting out God's judgment. Woe number one. Woe to the Babylonians' plunderers. They too will be plundered and will fall into debt. Woe two. Woe to the Babylonians, those who feather their nests. He quite literally compares them to birds who have their nests up high, thinking that they're safe and that they've got a safe place to store their riches. But he said that their houses will be brought down. Woe three, woe to the Babylonians' town builders who build their towns with blood, violence and sin. It will be of no avail. Why? Chapter 2, verse 14. For the Lord, sorry, well the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One day the whole earth will be filled with God's glory and their godless towns will be no more. Woe for, woe to the Babylonians, pervy drug pushers. I struggle with really a title for this one. It's not so much drugs here, but alcohol. There seems to be some sort of cultural thing that the Babylonians were heavy drinkers. We saw it back in 2 verse 5. Here though, they're sort of trying to push drink on other people, getting them drunk to take advantage of them. Some take it figuratively, so they're drunk on cruelty. But seeing our culture these past 60 years, you could believe it's literal that this is what they were doing. Getting girls drunk to get their clothes off. And God tells them, well, get drunk yourself, says God. Go show everyone your private parts, then everyone will see that you're uncircumcised, you bunch of heathen. It's basically what he says to them. Shame will come upon you. And violence that you have done to others, well, that violence will overwhelm you. And then woe five, the final woe. Woe to the Babylonians, idolaters. Those who try and wake up wood. Who try to stir up stone. Can't even speak to you, is his point. God, on the other hand, it's almost as though you can't speak to God. Verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now, of course, we can still speak in prayer to him, but it's more this idea that God is the one who stills all mouths, who can demand silence of anyone, who has that authority. Those idols are worthless, speechless pieces of wood, he's saying. So God is quite aware of the Babylonians' wickedness, and he's telling Habakkuk that actually he will be coming for them. He will judge them too. Yes, he will judge them by a more wicked nation, a faithless nation, but judgment will come upon them too. So God has answered Habakkuk's questions. And now Habakkuk, in response, prays in chapter 3. A prayer of acceptance. The last chapter is a short prayer and then a meditation on what God has revealed to him. It would seem that this... Uh, this chapter seems to strike such a chord with the people that it actually became part of the nation's worship. Hence the way that it looks like a psalm. So, you know, uh, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to a tune. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. And then at the end, to the choir master with stringed instruments. The reason that it strikes a chord is that it's in light of all this that we've heard, Habakkuk responds to God about all the suffering in the world and God's response to it. Habakkuk in verse 2 prays in the light of all he's heard. Have a look at verse 2 of chapter 3. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. In light of all that he's heard, in light of all the judgment that we've heard is coming, Habakkuk asks God to remember mercy. To do his marvellous works, but not to utterly destroy. And of course, God answered that prayer. A remnant of Israel were saved and lived on after the Babylonians. And ultimately, God will answer that prayer in the future. In that on judgment day, not all will be damned. 
but some will be saved. The righteous by faith shall live. God will show mercy. And the rest of the chapter is a meditation of where he's up to now in understanding what God is doing. Gone are the questions of chapter 1 and chapter 2. God has answered. He is the righteous one, the Lord. The one who gave the law in Sinai of the south. That's Timan and Paran sort of evoke that southern uh, place where the law was given. The time when lightning flashed, when the earth shook. The time when his enemies were killed by plagues. The Lord rescued his people and brought them into the land, splitting the sea, splitting the rivers, causing the sun to stop in its place as he brought victory to his people through Joshua. He's reminded that the Lord rescues his people and he knows that God will do it again. He will bring this down on the Babylonians. But as he understands this, verse 16, his body trembles, his lips quake. It becomes like Daniel, when Daniel hears about what's going to happen to the nations in the future. Daniel lays ill for several days. His face becomes pale and loses colour. Here Habakkuk's legs tremble as he considers what is to come. And yet, he accepts that this is what God's will is. He accepts that this is God's plan. His plan for his own people to be judged, and then the nation that attacks them to be judged in, return, in turn. Instead of accusing God or trying to change God's mind, he decides to accept that God will bring justice to their enemies, even while they will face the suffering themselves. And that's what we see there in um, the second half of verse 16 onwards. Yet I will wait, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon those who invade us, though the fig tree should not blossom nor the fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me to tread on high places. You see, in light of what we've read before, God has told him that suffering is coming for his people. He knows that they will be judged. But Habakkuk chooses not to protest, but to accept the suffering that's coming. Even if the crops fail, even if all their animals die, even if everything goes wrong for them as a nation, yet he will choose to rejoice in the Lord. He will take joy in God, the one who lifts their heads, the one who is their strength. When every earthly crop gives way, he then is still our strength and stay. He knows that God is our solid rock, our refuge. He is the one in whom our joy is grounded, not all those other things that he's talking about. And that means that for us as well, when we look on the news and we see the horrific state of things, when we look at our lives and all we see is a big mess, we can come to the Lord. We can call out, my Lord, we could call out, how long, O oh Lord? That's not wrong. But as we consider God's answer that he gave us in Christ, we, like Habakkuk, can come round to patiently waiting in the midst of the darkness. We can echo along with him our own circumstances, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor that promotion I was hoping for happen, though my health and the health of those I love fail, and my holiday gets cancelled, and my bills pile up, and there be no money in the bank, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And when we do that, we truly worship. We show the worth of the Lord. Because we're saying, though I have nothing else, only him, I have enough. And that shows the worth of God. Not so much when we rejoice in him and follow him in the good times, but when we do it in the bad times. When we say along with Job in Job 13, though he slay me, I will hope in him. That shows God's worth and Habakkuk sees that now. There's no probably here in these last chapters, is there? Though the fig tree should blossom, I probably will rejoice in the Lord. 
No, he's decided now, before this happens, that this is what he will do. He is resting in what God has revealed, and he knows that God will give him strength to wait for God's justice. And this evening we need to think, can we say the same? As we see the world around us in a mess, let's decide to find our joy in God, to rejoice in him. As we find our lives in difficult circumstances, let's decide that God will be our strength. And find our joy not in our circumstances, not in our own might and capacity to get through, but along with Habakkuk, in God, the Lord who is our strength. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you were enough for Habakkuk. Father, thank you that even though he saw that his world would fall apart, Father, that his nation would be torn apart, yet he was able to, to wait quietly. Father, he was able to rejoice in you and find his strength in you. Father, we pray that you would do that for us too. Father, help us to be able to wait patiently for your justice and be able to rejoice in you, even in the hard times. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.